good. So I, I asked, so yesterday I was presenting also here and I asked uh, to have this, uh, because I need my hands to be free. I'm a Greek guy and uh, I always, when I'm speaking, I need to move my, my hands, so I need that. Um, so yes, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, my name is Yanis Lapas. I am uh, from the company Vilo. So I am located in Germany and I'm responsible for the market segment of building services. Um, so for those who have been yesterday here, I was presenting yesterday the topic of uh, quality and uh, HVAC loops. And uh, today I will speak about um, chilled water, AC loops, and the special, let's say, functionality role of pumps. Also here you will see that I make the link to water quality because also here is a quite important topic. Um, and I need the clicker. You So there's always a plan B, there's always a plan B. So uh, I will stand here. Um, so first of all, I would like to give you a short introduction of my presentation. So um, I will start with the general market insights. So that means I will speak about the HBC market itself. I will give you some, let's say, outlook to the tendencies, the trends that we see. Um, and then I will speak about the key challenges and key drivers that we have in this kind of business. And from that, I will dive into the various systems that we have for air conditioning. So I will speak about the VRF, VRV uh, versus the, um, the chilled water systems. And then I will dive into the chilled water system as coming, let's say, from the pumping industry. I would like to show you the special functionality, um, key drivers, challenges of the pumps using, um, to be used in these uh, loops. And then finally, I will give you, let's say, some uh, let's say, insights regarding energy efficiency, and that goes also to your direction that you were speaking about. It's fine, thank you. And uh, last but not least, I will speak about digitalization. Um, so speaking about key drivers, uh, so why do we need air conditioning systems? So on one side, we have employees, we have customers, we have uh, residents that are living in, in space, and we want to provide them an let's say, comfortable indoor climate. But it's not only that, it's also um, technical requirements why we need uh, to have air conditioning when we speak about data centers. So the more we have to do with, let's say, digital services, online shops, and all this uh, social media and so on, you need in the background data center. So this is also increasing the, the need of uh, air conditioning. So having the look on the HVAC market, because we always speak HVAC market and we put it under one umbrella, um, there is, let's say, uh, on one side the air conditioning, the cooling application, on the other side the heating. And if we look to the figures, 60% of the worldwide HVAC market is for cooling. So that means we need more, um, let's say, cooling than heating. Um, and even more, me coming from Germany, we would think Germany is always, let's say, cold and so on. but. Also there, we start to speak about uh, in single-family houses, it would be nice to have an air conditioner, which is completely unusual. But somehow the climate change, there must be something, there must be really something. Uh, we have the need for air conditioning even in Germany. So um, just to give you, let's say, some market insights, 60% uh, of the energy consumption during summertime is for cooling. So this makes a high link to energy efficiency and, and uh, energy uh, decrease of consumption or increase of efficiency. Um, then we see a cover for the air conditioning market. So this is also related to that, what I was saying, that climate change somehow drives us to that direction. We have people in India and in China where their living standard is rising up. So they have also the need for a nice home, cool home and so on. Um, so 5% we see until 2025 that the market will increase. Um, also one tendency that we see approximately 13% is district cooling. 
uh, especially combined with, uh, with air conditioning for um, uh, data centers. Um, so this is something that is popping up, 13% worldwide. We see or we know from the past from Eastern and Russian oriented countries, the heating that is coming from the district application. Now also we see the same tendency for cooling. And then last but not least, digitalization. It's all over the world we speak about digital and smart and all this stuff. We see also here a clear tendency, um, about 25% that the market is increasing. We have, let's say, more and more the need for smart, connected, big data, big data analytics and so on. This is something that is definitely coming and we see that already. We are on the wave. So speaking about key drivers, so I was mentioning urbanization, reliability, people will have higher level of comfort and so on. But digitalization and energy efficiency are, from my perspective, the two drivers that we see that significantly driving our business. Um, so, but let's come back to the technology. So, I, I put here very general, let's say, schematics just to make the differentiation between these uh, technologies. Of course, there are some hybrids, and combinations, and all this stuff. Um, speaking about uh, VRF, VRV, um, let's say where we handle uh, the refrigerant uh, with a specific flow. What are the benefits? Easy to install, easy to maintain, easy to operate. Um, a big benefit is the individual room climate so that you can adjust it according to your needs, according to your employees and so on. Um, and the components are used specially outside. When we speak about globalization, people are coming together. So here is a very important topic to have uh, systems that are, let's say, silent. Let's say some disadvantages is the size that I'm mentioning. If you have once fixed, let's say, the size, you are quite limited to that, to expand it. And the refrigerant, this is the most critical topic that you need to handle. You have the refrigerant that is inside the building, bigger amount, what is with the leakage, how to handle it, and so on. So you need to pay here special attention. Speaking now about the chilled water system, um, you see here a very general uh, uh, schematic just to, to show you the, the loops and uh, in that case I, I put also the pumps there that you see uh, what is the role of the pumps. So on one side we have the pump to transfer the water from the chiller, the heated up water from the chiller to, to the tower, cooling tower, and then we have the primary loop and then to the consumers. Um, so free cooling is one thing, so you can use the ambient temperature difference from outside and in terms of dimensioning and size and so you're not limited. So the, the size and the pipe length and so on is unlimited, let's say. Um, when it's a bit, let's say, challenging is individual room control and uh, the water quality. So also here back, the link to my presentation from yesterday, you need to handle the quality of water. Handle the quality, the quality of water that you bring, you add to your system, and then you need to maintain this quality. So I will have one slide where I will um, give you some, let's say, very basic um, ideas about this, uh, this topic. Um, so on one slide, very briefly, what are, let's say, the main buzzwords when we speak about chilled water systems of comfort, silent, um, uh, components used inside the house. So in Germany, we see the tendency um, that you have underflow heating system and in summer you can even cool your, your house with that. Um, so comfort, yes, because it's silent. Uh, you can have reliable and natural sources, uh, even groundwater. So we see that tendency very, very often in Nordic countries, let's say, from Netherlands, Germany and more north. Um, from practicability point of view, as I said, no limit to the size, to the length of the pipes. You can extend your system and so on, especially when you have uh, airports and things that where continuously you are uh, growing and expanding and so on. Um, so here again, the pressure keeping system as a very, let's say, simple, comfortable system to maintain the pressure inside your system, your installation, and ecological coolant agent uh, where you have no risk let's say, uh, to uh, have some hazardous and uh, risk the safe of people. Um, looking now into this um, chilled water system, we have three main loops. So as I said, it's a very general uh, schematic. So on one side, we have the cooling. So the condensing cooling circuit, the heated up water from the chiller needs to be cooled down. In this uh, drawing, we have uh, one dry 
cooler installation where you pipe through the pipes and then you have some ventilation to cool down uh, and bring the uh, cooled water back to the, to the chiller. Or you can have alternative, a wet and open system where you spray the water and the thermal heat is ventilated by the ventilators. Uh, also there is a pump used from the sump to, to circulate the water. Then we have uh, the primary loop of the chilled water, so where we are creating the flow that we need from the main uh, primary loop to transfer it to, to the manifold and from that then to the consumers. So here we have some, some pumps installed. We will see later on, uh, let's say, some specific characteristics of these pumps, the size, the, uh, the pressure and so on that we need uh, to take care about. So as I said, water quality again, an important topic. Um, here I have a schematic that I used also yesterday, so we see here a uh, heating installation, but at the end of the day it doesn't make any, any difference because the requirements are exactly the same. The only difference is the temperature of the medium, so the temperature spread is different. Um, so starting here with, uh, let's say, the, uh, from number one, we have the air separators. So the air separators are there to collect air bubbles that are swimming in your medium. You are ventilating air pockets that are somewhere collected in your installation uh, because we learned yesterday that air will, let's say, lead somehow to corrosion. Corrosion will lead to particles. Particles will block your installation, your whatever components. So you see then uh, we have uh, point two, we have the dirt separator. So if you have some dirt, some sand or scale and so on, you will be able to, um, to collect them, to separate them from the water, take them out, flash them away. Um, then the pressure keeping system number three. Uh, in this drawing you see one very simple one, which is just a static screen, a membrane tank. Um, also yesterday we've seen that we can have there a pump driven system, we can have a compressor system and so on, depending on your installation size, execution and so on. Um, and then last but not least, the degassing system. So it means that when you have dissolved gas in your installation with a vacuum degassing, you're removing this, this gas according to the Henry law of gas. Um, and uh, then you are able, let's say, to maintain your system in the right uh, condition, let's say. Um, Speaking about uh, the pump, so when we have a look into the primary loop, so you see on the left side just an example, 400,000 square meters. It's the International Fair in Beijing. So you see on the upper uh, part the pumps that are used on the left upper part, so split case pumps for big flows uh, mainly. Um, so what are the key characteristics? So from planning point of view, what you should consider, typical medium temperature, 7 to 15. So this is what I said, the temperature spread compared to heating. It's just a lower one, a smaller one. Um, from pressure point of view, we have PN16, PN25. PN25 especially for high-rise buildings. So Middle East is a, and Russia and China is a quite common uh, requirement to have PN25 pumps uh, to be able to provide your, your, your pressure and your flow to the upper levels uh, if needed. Um, then the medium what we use is water, water plus glycol, different percentages. What you need to take care of when you have glycol is the mechanical seal um, that be, uh, needs to be adapted to that. Regarding the running conditions, so during the cooling, cooling season, uh, approximately maximum four and a half thousand hours. And uh, regarding the installation, so as I said before, when you are in Dubai and Middle East, you need to consider very high temperature, so up to 50 degrees uh, outside temperature, you need to be able to, to handle that. In terms of pumps that are used, so as I said already, we have here to do with big flow, so that's the reason why we use quite often uh, end suction pumps, inline pumps, block pumps, or inline pumps um, with various executions, various modes in a cascade installation, standby duty pump, and so on and so on. So this is really depending on your type of installation, your um, place of uh, uh, where it's installed and so on. And last but not least, uh, regarding the, let's say, the control modes, uh, the differential pressure, either constant one or variable, these are, let's say, the main characteristics when you have pumps used in the primary loop of a chilled water air conditioning system. So similar to that um, is the secondary loop. So you see here immediately we, we come to smaller pumps, smaller flows. Um, here we have an example um, of a stadium. Uh, with 30,000 seats, 
Uh, also here, you need to cool down uh, the specific uh, places. The temperature range is the same. The nominal flow is, is lower because here you don't have to deal anymore with uh, high-rise buildings and so on. You have more flat and small installations in there. And even the secondary loop is, let's say, providing to the end consumers. Mm. The rest of the requirements, again, here, the running hours that you need to consider, the, the medium that you need to consider and so on is uh, quite similar. As I said, well, the difference is here that you go to another level of, of, uh, of pumps in terms of size, so you have here more big circulators with uh, lower flow than required for the primary loop. And speaking about energy, we all know the ERP regulations, so European Union is considering us to reduce uh, the energy uh, consumption, increase the energy efficiency. There's a plan of 20% for 2020. So that's the reason why um, there have been this ERP regulation. So on one side, on the left side, we have the energy efficiency level or index for wet runners. So you have various levels that you need to respect. Um, so we are at the moment at the EI level of lower than 0.23. For the uh, dry runners, so for inline pumps, for example, we speak about the MEI, so the minimum efficiency index. So what we need to consider is here on the left side, the lower the value, the better it is. On the right side, the higher the value, the better it is. Um, and the dry runner, of course, combined with the efficiency of the motor, so EEI, two, three, four, five, whatever. Um, so this is what, what we need to know, what we need to consider when we plan a building, when we uh, are, let's say, uh, uh, putting these products into the installation. So I just have here a very simple uh, schematic to show you that when we have to do with, with pumps, because we see quite often that some pumps are entering our markets that they should not be there because of technological requirements. So if you have an uh, efficiency index higher than 0.23, then it's out of scope, you should not use that. So we should be careful with that and we should consider this. And the more we, let's say, um, increase the efficiency, so the lower the value gets, the more efficient we are um, at the end. So what we have at the moment, the um, efficiency um, level that we have reached is at 0 0.17, so this is, let's say, the premium in terms of technology and in terms of efficiency level that is available currently on the market. On the dry runners, exactly the same. Here is the combination of the pump, so the hydraulics, plus the motor. Here various combinations being in the EI1 or whatever, and um, an efficiency uh, level of 0 0.4 and higher, uh, and, and lower, sorry, uh, then you're out of scope. You should not use this kind of products. Um, also here we see that uh, for various projects, somehow these products are entering the market and we need to be aware about this. Uh, and also here, what we have, let's say, as a standard as the top performing uh, products is at EI4 and an efficiency, uh, minimum efficiency index of 0 0.7. This is, let's say, on uh, the top level what is available in the market. So always this energy efficiency, efficiency increase, saving energy, whatever, um, goes with some nice numbers and statistics. So the target is... If we do that, we will be able to, to save a lot of energy. And somebody did here the calculation and said, OK, if we do that, we will save three energy plants. And according to that, also um, CO2 uh, emissions. Um, last but not least, I was starting to, to speak also about digitalization. So this is clear that our projects require more and more products that are connected, are, let's say, uh, providing data. We can look into the system, we can write into the system from remote and all this stuff. But there is also a clear tendency that we see in the market that is dramatically increasing. It's the BIM, so the, the building information modeling. So that means that it, the pump is not a drawing, a 2 or 3D drawing. It's more than this, so behind this drawing, Behind this model, um, it's the so-called, let's say, MEP plan, where you have all the required data. You can uh, see the dimensioning. You can have some hydraulic information. You can simulate your installation. You can have all the commercial information about the product and so on. So it's attributes behind this product. Um, and this is, let's say, something that will definitely be the standard in our market very soon. 
Um, so we need to be prepared for that, not only from, let's say, uh, manufacturers, suppliers' point of view, but also the ones who are dealing with that. This is uh, becoming more and more the standard. There are some countries like UK, Netherlands, they are very strong in that, Nordics, Germany, started from zero to, let's say, 100% within two years. Um, and this is definitely something that we need to be aware of. So the drawing is not the architectural model only, it's the MEP plan and the constructional model, of course, uh, from architecture's point of view. So for us, is the MEP model uh, the most important one that we need to consider in our products, in our planning, in our, let's say, uh, activities. So finally, I, I'm coming more or less to, to the end. Um, at the end, I would like to give you, let's say, very quick, the summary of what we have seen uh, in my presentation. Um, so from market perspective, market insights, the AC market is bigger than the heating market. So worldwide, when having, let's say, the, the glasses, uh, what is happening in the world. So that shows the importance of this application. Um, Energy efficiency or energy consumption is also here an extreme important topic. We've seen that with the 60%. Um, and why is that important? We have energy shortage. Uh, we have, let's say, globalization, urbanization, and all that leads to the, to the point that uh, we need to consider this uh, application as one of the most important ones when we, we have to do with climate and buildings and so on. Then the technology itself. So. On one side, we have the VRF, VRV systems with the refrigerant. On the other side, we have the chilled water systems and even some combined hybrid systems. There are a lot of executions. I'm not the specialist for that. Um, three circuits in the chilled water system. From pump supplier perspective, you have the main loop, you have the chiller loop, you have the primary loop, the secondary loop, where we have our products, our systems to provide several functions. And not to forget um, the water quality Again, it's about to bring the water into the system with the right condition and maintain this condition. This is extremely important. And from pumps perspective, so we have um, these dry runners, uh, I was saying, uh, for the primary loop, so big flows, split case pumps, inline pumps, and so on. For the secondary loops, we have the wet runners, the big circulators. Um, and then uh, we have also here the energy efficiency that we are following the EEI level, the MEI level for the wet and the dry runners. And last but not least, let's say this clear tendency of digitalization, the products must be smart, digital, connected, and so on. And of course, the BIM as, let's say, somehow an umbrella where you need to be able to handle your product in a smart way. So that was it from my side. Thank you, Thank you very much.